Hey everybody, it's Talknosis, and today we're talking to Brittany Mueller. Is that how you pronounce it? Uh, it's Muller. Muller, Brittany Muller, about her book, The Contemplative Tarot. Hello, Brittany. Hello. Uh, real pleasure to have you here this morning. I really enjoyed your book. I think everybody out there is really going to enjoy hearing about it, and then they're going to run out and buy copies. I really hope everybody goes out and does that. We'll put links in the show notes. Uh, but before we uh, be uh, before we get to the interview, talking about uh, money, purchasing, the exchange of goods and services, we are supported by uh, donations through Patreon. Uh, you can sign up for as little as a dollar per piece of media per month. You can also put a cap on that so you can sign up just for a dollar or whatever's in your uh, budget or paypal.me slash gnostic we don't really give you anything for signing up for the patreon we, you, you do get early access to the shows uh but we don't want to put anything behind a paywall but if anybody has any ideas or demands uh send them in because we we really do want to uh give back as, as much as possible and obviously we understand if you can't help us out financially just tell people about the show share people the uh uh, the show uh take this episode email it to a friend you know that mouth to ear uh the digital version of mouth to ear the person to person is powerful even in this age uh okay the commercial is over uh but Br Brittany, uh, uh you're you're promoting your new book I i'm sure you're you're doing other podcasts i understand i understand there mm -hmm. are other podcasts um and maybe you're like sick of this question uh but maybe you haven't gotten it before but it's like like the the subtitle of your book the tarot for christians and i think some people would be really surprised what what but for christians aren't, aren't tarot cards evil and pagan and for for telling the future and for looking into the the fates of individuals yeah um I, I've been doing so many podcasts, um, but I also, I love talking about this. It's like my favorite thing to talk about. So this has been great for me, actually. I feel like I just have like a captive audience over and over and over again. It's great. Um, yeah, that is usually like when I have conversations with people about tarot and Christianity, um, that's that's always the first question. Um, or like if people are more condemning, the first thing they say is like that tarot is a cult. So like that, you can't do that. It's just not possible. Um, and yeah, for me, like, uh, you know, I, I grew up in a Christian home um, and I was taught that tarot was, um, you know, like an occult tool and it was evil and it was like, like Ouija boards, you know, like it would like bring in evil spirits into your home. So you never wanted to mess with it. Um, and uh, for me, what really changed my mind was like, I think learning more about the history of tarot um, and learning that it really doesn't have occult origins at all. Um, and for me, I'm okay with using something that, that has had occult associations. Um, like that doesn't really bother me. Um, but I, I do think that um, tarot can be used in a prayerful way, for sure. Yeah. Well, um, how did you uh, get into tarot then? Like, like, and what's your relationship been to it? So, so I understand, like, as you're just saying, so you you grew up maybe thinking it was evil or at least having negative connotations, but, but you, you said when you discovered its origins, so why did you seek its origins? Uh, how did you find its origins? How mm -hmm. did you get uh, captivated or interested in tarot? So, so when, when and how? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I grew up, like I said, in a super Christian home, uh, my family converted to Catholicism um, when I was in middle school. Um, and so I was a really devout Catholic for a long time. And I had sort of a crisis of faith in college and left organized religion for a really long time. Um, I think I had just grown up with a very kind of dogmatic faith um, that didn't really leave a lot of room for doubt or having questions. Um, and I... I got to a point where I had a lot of questions and I didn't know how to be Christian and also have any sort of doubts about my faith. I, I felt like I, I couldn't hold both of those things. Um, so I left organized religion for a long time. And it was during that period outside of Christianity that I came to tarot. Um, we, I, 
I was living in Austin at the time and I had friends who played around with tarot cards and I honestly, honestly, I just bought it because I thought I bought a deck because I thought the art was really pretty and it seemed like sort of a fun thing to play around with. And I wound up being just like utterly captivated by it. Um, I really fell in love with it. Um, and for me, I feel like tarot really led me back to faith. I feel like it really led me back to Christianity um, because of the religious imagery um, in the cards, which is something I talk about in the book a lot, obviously. Yeah. Um, so for its origins, so can you tell mm -hmm. us a little bit about, about where tarot comes from and, uh, or, or at least where, where you think it comes from uh, and some of what, what your research uh, uh, has, has dug up and maybe what captivated you when you were first getting back into tarot or into tarot, mm -hmm. I guess, to begin with? Yeah, so um, for me, it was really fascinating to learn about tarot's origins. Um, it comes from the Italian Renaissance. The earliest tarot decks we have are from the Italian Renaissance, um, which is like a sort of like a time period in history that I've always loved anyway. Um, I love the art of the Renaissance and the theology and the philosophy uh, of that time period. And for me, it made so, it helped me to make so much more sense of tarot, to know it's like historical and cultural origins. Because um, when I started playing around with tarot, as someone with like a very Christian background, the first thing that really jumped out to me was all of the religious imagery in the cards. And I felt like, it wasn't something that I saw a lot of other tarot readers talking about. And so it was really confusing for me at the time. And for me, learning about its origins in the Renaissance, just like, it was kind of the missing puzzle piece. Um, I talk about this in the book. Um, I have a chapter on the history of tarot. It's a pretty like brief chapter uh, because I feel like there's so much that could be said, you know? Um, but I talk a little bit about um, just sort of the context of the Renaissance and how that comes through in tarot. Um, the fact that Renaissance Italy was obviously um, like a deeply Catholic culture, but also was experiencing you know, the Renaissance, like this revival of classical antiquity that people were really excited about and how so many of the philosophers and artists of the time were trying to figure out how to sort of marry those two things, like the pagan cultures of ancient Greece and Rome with a very Christian worldview and how to hold those together. And that's the kind of stuff that I saw in the tarot that I was like absolutely fascinated by. And so for me, like the historical origins of the cards, that was like a big um, sort of missing piece for me. Yeah. And and to clarify, it does seem that they they started as as playing cards, perhaps playing mm -hmm. cards for for nobles, at least uh, the earliest that we have seem to be really nice playing cards for nobles. That's the thing mm -hmm. about some of these materials. If they were uh, earlier, if there's earlier decks, they, they perhaps uh, didn't survive. But um, right. I, like, uh, I, I believe uh, that they, they don't go back to ancient Egypt, that, mm -hmm. uh, that, there's, uh, the, that, they, you, that they, they're not a spiritual technology from uh, Atlantis before it sank into the sea. I, I <laughs> right. agree that it, that it goes back to uh, Renaissance Italy. But, but when I look at the cards, even looking at those early decks, I, I can't help but to see more than, than a quote unquote, a simple uh, game of cards. You know, mm -hmm. I, I see platonic ideas in there. They sort of jump out at me. I see some yeah, very absolutely. powerful, powerful Christian ideas that, that are more than just surface level. Uh, so so what, what do you think about all that uh, with, with the understanding of, of them being playing cards? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I, 
I think that the earliest tarot decks were they they contained the four suits from like standard playing card decks, um, and then they had the special fifth suit, uh, which is the what we call the major arcana now, and. I do think that those, like the, the fifth suit especially, would have contained um, figures and ideas that would have been particularly interesting or relevant to, like you said, Italian nobles. Um, and so, yeah, I definitely think there are um, like platonic ideas um in the tarot because that's something that people were particularly interested in at the time um and i think there are um you know there are christian ideas there are also ideas and figures from um like pa pagan cultures um the one that like comes to mind um is the strength card. If you look in the early decks, um, like the Visconti Sforza um, from the Italian Renaissance, the strength card is not um, like the Waitsmith version of the card, the woman taming a lion, which is a very like Christian idea of the virtue of fortitude. Um, but it's actually Hercules and the Nimian lion, which um, is obviously from Greek, ancient Greek culture, and would have been um like a really popular artistic theme at the time um and so you see all these things popping up especially in the major arcana which i find just super fascinating yeah, yeah sorry I, I didn't put this in in our uh, question sheet but but something that kind of popped into my mind that i think uh, worth pointing out or discussing is you know in your book you talk about it starts off with these these very christian ideas and of course, maybe Christianized platonic ideas, a, a marriage of uh, of pagan and Christian, which of course by this point is, is something that's very old, right? And in mm -hmm. some f formal ways, the the church has uh, uh, adopted a platonic ideas, uh, obviously mm -hmm. very important influence on on theology. Um, but uh, it starts getting tangled up with occultism, perhaps much later than people would would think, right? So you know, mm -hmm. the eighteenth century, the nineteenth century. Um, mm -hmm. But, but with that tangled up uh, with uh, occultism, uh, and even talk about the Wade Smith de uh, deck, something, something that occurs to me is uh, it's, it's still deeply Christian because these people might have been perhaps deeply weird Christians by most people's standards. Definitely in the French occult revival, they mm -hmm. really considered themselves Christian. And I think uh, even For a lot sure. of the Golden Dawn people, like I, I think they considered themselves uh, 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 deeply Christian, maybe perhaps some of them didn't, but I, I was thinking the uh, the Christianity of the Golden Dawn is basically the Christianity of of say C.S. Lewis, right? This this very mm -hmm. Platonic, real myth idea. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, anyways, that that there's no question mark at the end of that ramble, but I was wondering what you think of this this continued Christian heritage that the really that the cards kind of stay in Christian hands until we get to the 1970s. Um, mm -hmm. with, with the exception of, of Alistair Crowley. <laughs> no, I, yeah, <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, I think that's absolutely true. Um, I really, um, you know, in the book I talked about the occult revivals of France and England and how, um, you know, tarot at that time became associated with the occult, but it didn't, one thing I guess I didn't make clear that I'm not thinking about or, or I haven't really thought about it until right now is that like it became associated with the occult, but it didn't necessarily disassociate itself from Christianity at that point, because you're right, the, the golden dawn, um, there were a lot of Christians in the golden dawn. Um, the, the first one that comes to mind because you mentioned CS Lewis is um, Charles Williams, who also, he was a member of the inklings, the sort of um, like, Oxford group um, with J.R.R. Tolkien and C.S. Lewis. Um, and he was very Christian. It, he was definitely like a sort of weird esoteric version of, of Christian, you know, I think as they all were at that time. Um, but yeah, um, 
I definitely think that there were still Christian roots. And part of the reason that I, so in the book I used the Rider weight deck um, as the sort of jumping off point for all of the interpretations. And part of the reason that I felt comfortable doing that is because Arthur Wheat was also Catholic or was at least raised Catholic. And Pamela Coleman Smith, the illustrator of the deck was a Catholic convert. Um, and so there are, I feel like even within the occult revival, there were still like Christian fingerprints <laughs> all over, you know, what was going on, um, which is really interesting to me. Yeah. Can you continue to, to talk a little bit more about the, the Smith weight deck, the Rider Smith weight deck, the Rider weight deck, or perhaps whatever you like to, uh, to call it. Um, and, and, yeah. and why you, you personally like it, why, why you use it, because it's, it's definitely my, my favorite. So I always like to hear why, why mm -hmm. others, uh, uh, love it, enjoy it, what they get out of it. Yeah. I try, I started out calling it like when I first got the deck, I called it the Rider weight deck. And I try now to call it the weight Smith deck because I like to, um, emphasize the fact that Pamela Coleman Smith was the illustrator, um, but I still slip sometimes. Um, but yeah, part of part of the reason I use the deck so much, like the prosaic reason I use the deck so much, is because it's the first deck that I bought. Um, it's the deck that I learned to read tarot with, and so for me, um, it feels very special in that way. Um, but I also, I mean, I love the illustrations, I love the art, and I also feel like of the, you know, more modern decks, I guess, like, and by modern, I guess I mean, like, post, like, occult revival decks, <laughs> um, I think it has, um, some of the most Christian influence, like, I feel like, um, it's full of little religious details. And so for me, it really meshes well with the way that I like to use tarot. Um, I feel like because Pamela Coleman Smith and Arthur Wade were both Catholics, I definitely see that influence. Um, even as I also see like, much more esotericism in the Wade Smith deck than I would in like the early Renaissance decks. Um, but it feels like a very comfortable deck for me to use. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Definitely calling it the, uh, the Smith rider or Smith Wade or whatever is, is, is so appropriate, not just because of her contributions being erased, but because she's obviously the genius of the deck. Uh, mm -hmm. Her illustrations are, are, are so amazing on so many levels. And one reason I really like them is that there is a, a sense of playfulness uh, there, like a, a, a mm -hmm. sense of humor that sometimes jumps out as well without turning the deck into some kind of joke or without overwhelming its its message. Mm -hmm. So she, she can just balance everything quite well, as well as the you know the levels of symbolism, which which more than an Italian uh, Renaissance deck for sure, but don't quite mm -hmm. overwhelm uh, the cards, so it doesn't become this very sort of boring, obviously uh, symbolic lesson. And you know there are right, some right. decks. And even decks from the from the occult revival, where all of a sudden they're covered in symbols and correspondences, and you know extra <laughs> details, and it's what is right. this? What is this? Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, it's uh, it's 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 it's. And I, I'm already a fan of Art Nouveau, and and I guess I I, mm. I really like it. Um, because of that imprinting, right? Because it was it was my first deck, it was my first exposure to tarot. So perhaps mm -hmm. if, if another deck, you know, if it had been the, the Hello Kitty deck, that would be the one that I would, would be the the platonic ideal of tarot in my head. Uh, but uh, but I think besides that imprinting, that that it does really have these these virtues uh, outside of that as well. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, I love that you I love that you mentioned the playfulness of the deck because like I I really love that too. Um, and I've played around with like all sorts of different decks. Um, and I do feel like a lot of them are too serious feeling <laughs> for yeah. me. Um, and like what you were saying about all of, all of the, the symbolism and all of the associations and some of the decks are like very, very detailed. Um, and I think it can be overwhelming. Um, but I really like that Pamela Coleman Smith um 
I feel like she captured the essence of every card without taking it super seriously, you know, and I just really love that. Yeah, yeah, me too. Um, okay, so so why tarot for Christians now? Like if, if specifically for Christians, because if people want to expand their faith and their practice or, or perhaps their contemplative practice, well, you know, why not centering prayer or Ethiopian liturgical dance or, or, or something else besides <laughs> these, uh, these fun, weird cards? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think part of it is that tarot, I do think is experiencing um, like its own sort of renaissance right now. Um, I think it's become much more popular in the last, I guess, like 10 years, but especially the last five years or so. Um, and I, the way I see people using tarot now, um, I just find it really fascinating because in my own like tarot circles on Instagram and stuff like that, um, even among non-Christians, I feel like there's been, um, and again, this is like a generalization. I definitely still know people who use tarot for divination, but I also feel like there's been a move away from tarot for divination towards tarot um, for, I guess, more therapeutic purposes, um, like tarot for self-reflection. And I think that alone has done a lot to make the idea of using tarot in a prayerful way um, less scary or less crazy um, to Christians. Um, and so I think that now feels like, I don't know, sort of the right time for it. I know a lot of Christians who were um, particularly interested in using tarot in a prayerful way because tarot had been sort of demystified for them. Right. Um, this next question I'm going to, to uh, the wording is going to be kind of strange. I'm going to, I'm going to word it uh, very carefully um, because uh, I don't want anybody to get the wrong, wrong idea uh, about my intention. It sounds something like really weird, but it's, it's not that <laughs> not great, Brittany, but um I, I I think that there's there's many paths to to the truth, and uh, I'm happy to see a blooming of any kind of spirituality in in in, in the secular West, right? I, I don't actually mm -hmm. think that the secular West. I think we just transfer our religious impulses into lots of different places. So I'd like to see those religious impulses go to something that is at least some kind of religion. Um, mm -hmm. And I think many of these perhaps uh, occultic uh, religions can can be very deep and very satisfying. Um, the, uh, this is a huge disclaimer. But but I think that, that, that some of them um, and some people who are spiritually curious and, and using tarot stumble into, you know, forms of, uh, of, of spirituality that, that, that are very surface level um, and often are connected to, to forms of consumerism. So, so to make a long story short, I'm not saying, you know, are the cards going to win souls for Christ? This is what I'm trying to not, not say. But, but you think that they could lead people to a, a deeper form of spirituality, a deeper form of faith, whatever that, that deeper form could be, that perhaps it's good that they're out there and perhaps in some cases being used in uh, flaky ways. I'm trying not to be judgmental, but more surface level ways. Uh, and mm -hmm. if people really spend a lot of time with the cards, it could lead them to, to a deeper relationship with, with uh, whatever the logos is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um... I definitely think it's possible. I mean, I think that is, um, I think that's kind of what happened with me and my own relationship with the cards because I picked them up because I thought they would be fun to play around with. I originally had a very surface level relationship um, with the tarot. Um, but I also, I think one of the great things about tarot um, and one of the reasons I think it's a really helpful spiritual practice um, is that I think tarot is um, contemplative or meditative sort of by nature. Um, I think one of the ways tarot sort of led me back to faith was like not even in the images themselves, but just in creating a space where I could like sit 
quietly with my thoughts, which I think is is really hard to find. That sounds prosaic, but um, I think tarot is particularly good at that. And so I think if people are, you know, I think open to the idea of using tarot, um, I do think even a relationship with them that starts out as very surface level um, can become a deeper thing. Um, for me, you know, pulling a card every day and sitting with it for a few minutes, um, for me, it felt so much like prayer. <laughs> and it really reminded me of um, what I had been missing from um, sort of like organized religion um, and what I had been running away from. I think it very clearly showed me um, that sort of hole in my life that um, I had not really wanted to admit to myself was there and couldn't really admit to myself until I, I had the space to like really contemplate it. Um, and for me, Tara was particularly good at that. Yeah, I, I, I see it too. I, I actually have had a, a little bit of personal experience with this, um, which is kind of using the, the, the cards as, as grounds for a little bit of interfaith dialogue, at least for, mm -hmm. the, the, there's often kind of a, an ambient distaste for, for, for Christianity, um, sometimes earned, sometimes not, uh, particularly mm -hmm. in, in certain circles. And I don't want to make assumptions about you, Brittany. But you know, uh, you, you probably went to university. Like uh, um, the, the, uh, you're a writer. Uh, sometimes uh, there's just a uh, um, a distaste for uh, uh, for the Christian faith. Um, Absolutely. Among, yeah, particularly among a lot of uh, spiritual, not religious people. Now, but, mm -hmm. uh, but of course, some of these spiritual, not religious people. Uh, um, uh, 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 th th this sounds like a chick track where I'm like winning an argument or something, uh, but it's th that's not what it is at all. It's like, oh, hey, we, we can actually have some common ground because it's like, I, I know you, you you think you really hate Christianity, but, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I'm not trying to say your, your precious cards are uh, actually belong to Jesus, but, you know, the, the, a lot of the symbolism kind of has, has Christian roots. And, you know, I, mm -hmm. I, I think this kind of this form of, of mystical contemplation might be something that that uh that you've experienced when you're using the cards right mm -hmm. and it's it's uh it's 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 a, a ground for for connection not a mm -hmm. uh aha uh you're, you're secretly using something that's christian um, right right yeah. yeah i i try to like i know exactly what you're talking about <laughs> and i try to walk that line really finely because i never i never want you know sort of spiritual but not religious people or people who sort of have a chip on their shoulder about Christianity, often for like perfectly valid reasons, to feel like I'm trying to like reclaim tarot for Christianity, you know. Um, but I do think it can be used um, like within the context of Christianity as well. And I also, I'm trying to figure out how, to say this, um, like I think it can be, um, I wanna call it like a tool for evangelization, but I don't feel like I'm evangelizing. Um, but I, I've known so many people, I've met so many people in the last few years who grew up within Christianity and left Christianity um, and seem really interested in using tarot to sort of re-explore their faith or re-engage it in some way, because tarot is, you know, a tool that is familiar to them. And it's not, it feels like a safe way to sort of re-engage um, in faith, which for me is super exciting because, you know, I think that um, I mean, I'm a Christian. I think that Christianity is like a really wonderful, um, contemplative, mystical religion. And I think a lot of people who grew up in Christian faith um, don't always have a sense of um, the more mystical aspects of Christianity. And I feel like tarot is 
sort of one way to explore that, which I think is really exciting. Yeah. And uh, folks, we're really not doing our uh, uh, our hour of power uh, evangelicism here, but uh, yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I I think too, maybe even uh, speaking specifically as as a Catholic, right? Like, there's there's almost a billion Catholics on Earth. Like, that's that's there's going to be some diversity in thought, right? Mm -hmm. That's an awful lot of people, and uh, I think sometimes people outside of the Catholic Church don't don't realize that, right? It's mm -hmm. that's. That's not just a nation. That that's a couple. That that's a lot of nations contained within yeah. that billion. So, but uh, but but uh, I, as it's specifically within kind of Catholic circles, has it has it been well received? Have have people been interested uh, specifically in in RC circles? Um, it honestly, it totally depends on the person. Um, I have had just like the widest possible range of reactions to the book um i have a couple of catholic writer friends who like blurbed the book for me and have like their names in the book like endorsing the book um carl mccullman who wrote the foreword for the book is a catholic um you know i've also gotten a lot of condemnation from catholics because catholics i think or a lot of catholics are um I think tend towards like superstition and I mean that in like the kindest possible way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I don't want to sound like judgmental. I am also superstitious about some things. Um, but I've also met a lot of Catholics who believe that like the cards that like the physical cards themselves contain some measure of evil and even having them like in your home is like opening up like a portal to like evil, you know? Right. Um, so honestly, I mean, it just like completely depends on the person. Every time I tell like a new Catholic friend about the book, I have no idea how they're going to react. <laughs> um, it's been, uh, really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I should I should move on and actually get into the book. But the the final thing I'll say on this uh, this particular topic is is what did it for me was I, I, as a teenager it might have been those those Stuart Kaplan Encyclopedia of Tarot if you know those or, or I think uh, so cause, yeah because I think those list like they have a section where they just list the different theories about tarot uh, uh -huh. even though with, with kind of a disclaimer that you know we don't actually think that these are true and and one of them is the uh, uh, which I think you give a, a passing shout out in your book which is that uh, they come from the Waldenesses, this sort of proto-protestant-ish mm -hmm. uh, uh, sect uh, from the, uh, the 14th century 15th century but it, you give a passing mm -hmm. to it in your book but anyways the theory which is most certainly not true is that they wanted to teach the bible to the common people i, I think that part is true but the common mm -hmm. people were illiterate so they made a uh, a, a book of images as, as a teaching tool to go through the countryside and it had to be portable and then the Waldenesses were being persecuted so the uh the the book of images got turned into playing cards so they could be hidden but anyways once <laughs> i encountered that theory Brittany, it sort of ruined my brain yeah. in that now i can only see the cards as like as christian and really see the christian symbolism so strongly in them so even though yeah. that kind of romantic myth is not true i, I guess in, in a way it, it uh, kind of opened my eyes to some truth so i guess that's a very neoplatonic way of looking at some some legends and myth right there yeah um okay so let's actually get into this this awesome book of yours with with how do i pray with the tarot and can we talk about some of the methods you have in your book i i really love that that you mentioned journaling could you talk about journaling tarot and and how and why that can be prayer work with prayer if mm -hmm. incorporated into your prayer time what have you yeah um yeah i talked about that in the book because or i wrote about it in the book because um, that's how I learned to um, read tarot, I guess. I think one of the things that can be really overwhelming to people is um, just the this, this sheer number of cards. There are 78 cards in a deck. Um, it, it feels like a lot of images, and it can feel overwhelming to pick up a deck for the first time and feel like you don't know what anything means. Um, and to feel like you don't know where to start. <laughs> um, so the way I learned tarot is by um, drawing one card every day 
and just writing about it. Um, and it, it doesn't, um, it doesn't even have to be like, it doesn't have to be complicated. Like I would write about what the image looked like. I would write about details that jumped out to me. Um, I would write about, um, you know, like what thoughts and feelings came up when, um, I saw the card and, um, part of the reason I included, um, reflection questions for each of the cards in the book is because I feel like journaling is such a helpful way to learn the cards. And I also, I just feel like journaling can be a form of prayer anyway. Like I think a lot of times when I sit down and just try to pray, my mind wanders so much. And for me, sort of writing out my prayers or writing out my conversations with God can um, sort of help keep me focused. But I'm like a writer by nature anyway. So for me, that's just, that's a really helpful thing to do. Yeah, yeah. Um, what about uh, daily prayer? Uh, for those who, who pray every day, perhaps pray more than once a day. Yeah. Um, so this is, this is how I use tarot now. Um, I am Catholic, so I pray. Um, I pray the Liturgy of the Hours, but I don't pray all of the hours in the Liturgy of the Hours. Um, I pray um, like the Office of Readings every morning from the Liturgy of the Hours, which contains um, like. Um, scripture and um, psalms and usually like a short passage from like um, like a church father or a saint um, and what I do is I incorporate tarot into that prayer um, so every morning I wake up and I make my coffee and I sit down with my tarot deck and my prayer book and the first thing I do is I shuffle my cards and pull a card. Um, I think you could pull more than one, but for me, I like I really like just pulling one card a day. Um, otherwise, I get just like overwhelmed. Um, <laughs> so I pull one card and I spend like five or ten minutes just looking at the card and not doing anything else, which is like one honestly like one of my favorite parts of the day. Because I think we were talking about how in the Waitsmith Smith deck, like the images are, are pretty simple. And I really love like giving my attention to one simple image for like five or 10 minutes. Um, I think because like because of, because of my writing and like especially with the book release and stuff like that, I'm on social media a lot. And so I take in, I feel like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of images every day. And for me, it's really nice to just sit down and look at one thing <laughs> for five or 10 minutes. Um, that was kind of a tangent. But um, once I've spent some time with the card, I set it aside and I do my morning prayer and I keep the image of the card sort of in my mind as I read through my prayers for the day. And sometimes I'm able to make really clear connections between the card and whatever the readings are for the day. And um, sometimes I'm not. It's I, like, I don't feel like it's a magical process. Um, but I do think it's really nice to add like an extra layer or an extra dimension to um, the readings for the day. Because I feel like what often happens is that whatever tarot card I've drawn that day um, sort of guides me to notice things in my prayer that I might not notice otherwise. Um, it also, I feel like, helps to keep me focused um, and less distracted during prayer. 
Um, and yeah, I mean, I think it's just a really helpful, prayerful way to sort of like open doors in my prayer life that I think otherwise would, would not be opened. Yeah, it, it definitely sounds like a, a great way to incorporate some of this um, silent and quiet uh, contemplation into this uh, perhaps a you know more verbalized prayer, the the written mm-hmm. prayer, the the prayer of the hours uh, that that you're doing, and uh, I, I think this this quiet time, not not to make it uh, uh, sound demeaning, is, is so important regardless of of what what form it comes in uh, here in the modern age, because I feel it in my own brain, I think particularly after lockdown, uh, and I already, you know, work online, uh, I already have a strong internet addiction, but the post lockdown, my, my attention is even uh, worse, right? Yeah, and, uh, same. I find, yeah, so, so I, you know, for, for me, it's mindfulness meditation, but, but I think anything that causes us to 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 slow down and have this refocusing of our attention is so need it more than ever um, Mm -hmm. in in the history of humanity, whatever form that may take. And I I think this, uh, um, this tarot contemplation might be a particularly powerful form for a lot of people because sometimes, you know, the mindfulness meditation, this, this uh, I'm not saying that it's harder or or tougher or whatever, but it's, it, it can be uh, perhaps a a bit more challenging if you're new to it, right? Because you're just sort Mm -hmm. of rolling around inside your own skull um maybe maybe you're falling asleep if you're doing it early in the morning but but something like this this contemplation and journaling uh uh, thinking about a tarot card i I think still really has this this attention focusing right while still not leaving you uh completely alone to uh to jump up and down and inside one's skull (laughs) yeah for sure Um, Okay, so uh, daily prayer and journaling, the, the the daily examine, if you can tell us about that and uh, perhaps using it uh, in tandem with tarot. Yeah, yeah. So this is one of my favorites. Um, the daily examine is um, a prayer practice from the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius. Um, St. Ignatius of Loyola is one of my favorite saints. Um uh, a Spanish saint. He founded uh, the Jesuit order. That's, I think, what he's most well known for. Um, and he wrote this um, set of exercises that could be used for discerning the will of God in one's life. And I think the daily examine is, I would say, the most well known of, of all of the spiritual exercises. Um, it's a really simple practice. Um, I think Ignatius recommended that it be prayed at night before you go to bed. And, um, it involves asking yourself two questions. Um, so you look back on your day and you ask, um, you know, what gave me life today and what drained me of life today. So you look for, um, first for the presence of God in your life. And then you look for, um, not the absence of God in your life because it, it, it is one of like my strongest held beliefs that God is never actually absent from us, but I think God can feel absent from us sometimes. So like the perceived absence of God, uh, in your life and, I think that this can work really well with tarot. Um, In general, I don't love asking questions of tarot, um, partly because it leans um, pretty close to divination for like my own personal comfort levels with divination. Um, And I also think tarot works best um, when it's used in a really open-ended way. But um, I do think that the questions of the daily examine are open-ended enough that it it can work really well with tarot. Um, So when I do this, I like to um, ask myself at the end of the day, you know, what what gave me life today? Where did I feel God in my life today? And draw a card. Um, And then I, I ask myself, you know, where did I feel like, the perceived absence of God in my life today and draw another card. 
Um, and again, sometimes I feel like the cards that I pull are very clear and sometimes they're not. Um, but regardless, I feel like it, it often leads me to contemplate moments in my day that I might not contemplate otherwise, you know, um, it just sort of leads me down new paths, I guess. Yeah. Well, since we're talking about uh, St. Ignatius, I, I think a lot of uh, people who sort of get involved with the cult movements that are influenced by the 19th century, um, uh, for even stuff like Vajrayana Buddhism, uh, are sometimes surprised, sometimes delighted, depending on their personality, so to discover there's a lot of visualizations. Um, mm -hmm. and a lot of practices uh, that use the imagination and see uh, uh, very specific scenes and see yourself within scenes. So I, I was wondering if you could kind of talk about visualization, uh, divine visions, Saint Ignatius and tarot, and, and perhaps how all these things could, could connect together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, Ignatius was really big on um, the imagination, I guess, and that's one of my favorite things about him. Um, he was a man with like a towering intellect. He was such a smart man, um, but was also like very imaginative. And I feel like had a very um, romantic personality. Um, and uh, a big part of Ignatian spirituality is visualization. Um, one of the things Ignatius loved to do was, um, and one of the things he talks about in the spiritual exercises is reading passages from the gospel and inserting oneself into the scene as like a form of prayer. Um, and like, you know, really engaging the senses in that way. Um, like if you were um, to insert yourself and be present in the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. Like what, what would you be smelling? What would you be hearing? What would you be feeling? Um, and I, I think that kind of imagination is so helpful um, in Christianity. And I think can be really helpful in using tarot as well. Um, and this is something that I've heard um, sort of non-Christian tarot readers talking about as well, like inserting oneself into the scenes of the cards and seeing, um, or, or, you know, feeling how that feels. Um, I think it's super interesting. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I, I've done a sort of an Ignatius influence uh, the Catholic retreat before, and it uh, built around the inserting yourself into scenes, uh, visualizations, and it's it's very powerful. And it was a very interesting center because you know they actually took people of any denomination, but also any faith. In in that particular uh, group, that it was it was all Christians, but they said that they've had. Uh, uh, Jews and Muslims come, and then they they've either used you know kind of uh, passages from the from the Tanakh, from the Old Testament, or even from the Quran. Uh, the spiritual directors and oh, had people visualize themselves into the scenes. So it was um, uh, very uh, yeah very interesting, very very powerful. Uh, if if if, if uh, anybody out there uh, check check your local uh, Catholic retreat centers uh, if if the uh, if, it's similar uh, retreats are being offered. I, I heartily recommend that you take one. Uh, okay, so so setting spiritual intentions. Can you tell us uh, about that and uh, tarot? Yeah, I um, this is an idea that sort of came out of my interest in religious art. Um, in the book, I talk about how, um, you know, I grew up in a very Christian home and my family had religious art sort of <laughs> like everywhere in our house. Um, we had holy water fonts and icons and like, you know, the mandatory statue of Mary out in the front yard. Um, and for me, I always really, really loved um, the religious art in our home. For me, it made our home feel really special. It made it feel really different from other people's homes because I would go to friends' homes and they would have like, they would have like photos of their families on the walls. 
And I'm like, this is so weird. Like, where are your like icons of like Jesus? <laughs> I don't get it. Um, but for me, I always really loved it. And for me, that's what feels like home. So as an adult, I've done the same thing. I have religious art um, like all over the place. I have like Mary and baby Jesus up here. Um, and I feel like tarot can be used in the same way, um, especially because of its religious influence, um, its Christian influence. Um, so I've started doing this thing where I have like a little card holder on the bookshelf in my bedroom and um, sort of I, I spend time every once in a while sort of thinking about um, where I am spiritually in my life and what I need spiritually in my life um, at that time. And then I choose a tarot card based on whatever my spiritual needs are at the time. Um, and then I keep that card propped up in my bedroom um, where I see it, um, you know, sort of throughout the day. And it can sort of pull me back to um, my interior self and my spiritual life and um, what I really need at the time. Um, right now I have um, the Empress um, because... Um, for me, the Empress is really about um, the idea of God as mother and the maternal nature of God. Um, that's how I wrote about it in the book. Um, and I have just like in my personal life, I have two kids. Um, I'm very pregnant right now. <laughs> There's another baby due uh, next month. Um, and so I've been thinking a lot about motherhood and um sort of how to be a good mother to my older two children as we like welcome a new baby for the first time in like eight years and how that's gonna change our, our family life. Um, and for me, it's really helpful to have um, a card like the Empress up where I'm sort of constantly reminded of the maternal nature of God and how I can translate that into, you know, my daily life. Um, you tell us about uh, like each card in your book, which is which is super awesome. So you sort of have a, a reflection and questions on on the entire deck. Can you tell us a little bit about these reflections? I know you can't take us through them all, and, and maybe how we can kind of <laughs> contemplate the cards using these reflections and these questions. Yeah, I um, I do have a reflection for all seventy eight cards, <laughs> which is something I really wanted to do. Um, a big inspiration for my own book, obviously, was Meditations on the Tarot. Um, and um, it's a brick of a book. Yeah. Um, but he, he only writes essays for um, the Major Arcana. Um, and I really wanted to have a chance to go through the entire deck. Um, and yeah, each one is really like each reflection is really, I feel like the fruit of my own prayer. Um, like I was telling someone the other day that um, I feel like what I do with tarot is similar to the prayer practice of Visio Divina, um, which is a practice of praying with images where um, you sort of look at an image with open eyes and an open heart and you see if, if God speaks to you through that image. Um, and for me, what I really did was like practice Physio Divina with every single card in the deck um, and then write a reflection based on that. Um, but I did um, also include like Bible verses for each card. Um, I write about the saints for the court cards. I pair each court card with a saint. Um, a lot of the reflections contain um, sort of relevant um, like Bible stories and stuff like that. Um, and then each card also has reflection questions um, sort of based on the card. Um, 
but I also do hope, and I wrote, I wrote about this in the book as well. I do hope that, um, like, I, I feel like these reflections are the fruit of my own prayer. And I hope that people don't take them as like the sort of definitive guide to um, <laughs> Christian tarot. Like, I hope that it inspires people to um, sort of make their own connections, you know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, there's this horrible phrase. Uh, I hate to end the interview like this. There's this horrible <laughs> phrase, but it, it works. It works for me. It communicates the idea, but it's, it's quote unquote spiritual technologies. And, and I see tarot as a spiritual technology, but as we talked about, particularly pseudo to Christians, even if it has this kind of a cultic air uh, about it. Do you know, or do you think that there, there might be uh, other spiritual technologies that you think Christians may want to have an open mind about? Yeah, I mean, I hope so. Um, there are none that like particularly come to mind, but I don't know. I, I think this is kind of like, I feel like this is like a big picture response to kind of a small picture question. Um, but I think for me, one of the like greatest gifts of um, sort of coming back to Christianity via tarot um, was that it was like a, I think a deeply humbling experience for me. Um, as I mentioned before, I grew up in a very sort of like dogmatic kind of Christianity um, where I was told that, you know, the Catholic church had all the answers and like, here is where you can find God and here is where you cannot find God. And um, for me, it was really wonderful to come back to that faith through tarot because it really opened my eyes to the idea that, um, I don't know, I think God is bigger than we give God credit for. And I, I mean, who are we to say where or how God can and cannot speak to us? And so I think in general, you know, my whole journey with tarot has made me much more open to the idea of finding God in sort of unexpected places. And I think that's, um, I think that's something that a lot of Christians, um, I don't know, could benefit from, I guess. Yeah. Well, I think that's a wonderful note to to wrap up on. Uh, uh, by the way, people, we're out. If you're listening to us as a podcast, we're on YouTube. And if you're watching us on YouTube, we're out as a podcast. So because of that, Brittany, can you tell people where to find you on the web, your homepage? Can you tell us again the title of the book and where people can get it and all that good stuff? Yeah. So um, the book is called The Contemplative Tarot, A Christian Guide to the Cards. And you can find it wherever books are sold. Um, and on the internet, I am mostly on Instagram at blessed.vigil. Um, and I also have a Substack called Blessed Vigil. Those are like the places where I am most active on the internet. I have Twitter as well, but I'm not on Twitter very much. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. We'll also link those in the show notes. So everybody check those out, get a copy of the book. My quick plug is uh, mylandmeditation.substack.com. That's uh, open, secular mindfulness, great for everybody. Uh, I do a little bit of medita meditation coaching on the side uh, as a career. So I also do a uh, free Sunday morning to keep my skills sharp and to give back and what have you. So 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, Montreal time, check that out mylandmeditation.substack.com we gather online it's a great uh, sunday morning activity okay uh thanks again Brittany. uh everybody out there again check out the book i really loved it and uh goodbye bye everybody